I'm your Redeemer! It is by my hand that you will rise from the assets of this industry! Do not, my friends, become addicted to early access, for developers will abandon it and you will resent their absence. That's it. I spent a lot of money on this just so I could call myself Jim Orton Jim. Now that's it. That's really it. The term walking simulator has become popular over the past few years, used to pejoratively describe a certain style of game that, thus far, doesn't have a catchy mainstream genre name. We're talking games like Dear Esther, Gone Home, The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, narrative-driven exploration games in which your interaction almost entirely consists of walking and experiencing a story unfold. No real puzzles, no combat, just a quieter, contemplative story. Done right? These can be excellent games that do not deserve the sneering contempt some ultimate hardcore gamers pour on them. Done wrong, they wholly deserve the derogatory term of walking simulator and no amount of smug preening from the art critic set will change that. So perhaps you'd like to make one of these games. It's an attractive prospect for any indie developer. Without combat to worry about and minimal puzzling, a lot of design barriers are lifted. No AI to program, highly reduced animation concerns. There are big benefits to a game that strips away a lot of common video game expectations. However, like Daredevil's heightened senses, when you take away certain elements, you need to raise your play everywhere else. This is how we make sure we have a genuinely memorable experience. Rather other than another humdrum walking simulator, because Dear Esther was years ago. Back then, you could get away with just walking and having story regurgitated at you because it was unique and a break from the norm. To help people avoid mistakes in future, I've cheerily concocted a few things to do and avoid so you don't become another everybody's gone to the rapture. First of all, tone. Setting the tone is important for any game that aims to provoke a reaction from its audience, we all know that, but, and here's the important thing, you need that tone to vary. This is one of the biggest stumbling blocks I've noticed in a lot of these games. You get a game like Wanda, proud to be a non-combat game, but incapable of raising the stakes beyond that premise, a premise that's become rather trite by modern standards. Wanda throws you into an island environment, tells you to explore, and that's it. There are no crescendos built to, no sense of narrative progress, not even any real change in the scenery. The tone it sets at the beginning, quiet and explorative wonder, is the tone it maintains throughout its entire run. No ups, no downs, no moments of sweeping jubilation, no sense of fear or comedy or sadness. This is lethal to a game of this nature. We as people need peaks and troughs in our stories. If a game starts out as all guns and violence and blood and action, then that can become exhausting without downtime in between. It's why Gears of War, for example, intersperses its combat sequence with walking segments and even horror elements, because our reaction to the bloodshed would be apathy through overexposure if we didn't have breaks in between. Similarly, a game about exploration and wonder soon loses its appeal when the wonder wears off because there's nothing to break up the endless walking and looking at things. Submerged commits this crime too. Initially, it's exciting to see this bright, saturated, beautiful looking water world, but after you've climbed the same old building 10 fucking times, it's lost any sense of emotional impact. Uh, mediocre. Compare this to Journey, which is no more interactive and yet is constantly shifting its tone. You get your quiet moments of subtle interaction, you get tense and dark moments, you get fast sweeping scenes as you roll down hills with gorgeous sunstreaks and a sweeping soundtrack. Journey never holds one note for long. It's always evolving and changing. That's why Journey is so critically acclaimed, even among those who usually snort at so-called walking simulators. Because it really is a journey. Its scenes are so memorable because they stand out from each each other. It's had such an emotional impact on its audience because it understands that moments of sadness work better when they follow moments of joy. That being somber from beginning to end just induces exhaustion from the audience. That familiarity breeds contempt. Meanwhile, Wanda has one setting, one tone, for ages, and it's boring as fucking piss. 
Now I actually liked the vanishing of Ethan Carter well enough, but it did commit one cardinal sin that needs criticising. It made the story you're passively watching far more engaging than the story you're playing. To the point where I wish the game was about the backstory. In Ethan Carter, you piece together the tale of a missing boy and this weird cult-like shenanigans of the family he lives in. The narrative is fascinating, but this story of a young boy whose family becomes possessed by an ancient and unknowable entity is something I'd much rather be playing than merely looking at. With every flashback the game presents to me, I find myself wishing that this was the game I was playing because it looks like a really enthralling one. Instead, Ethan Carter has you kind of mopping up the resulting mess of a superior tale, never getting to directly experience it yourself. This lack of story involvement is a real issue for some games. Not to bag on everybody's gone to the rapture too much, but it's a real offender here. You're wandering around a deserted Shropshire with evidence of a vastly more exciting and interesting story. A story you're not part of. I imagine what the game could be like if we were there, in the moment, directly interacting with the characters and taking part in the events that led to the titular rapturing, and it makes me sad, because it sounds like an awesome fucking game. Don't present me the ghost of an experience I'd prefer to have over the one you're actually giving me, because the biggest feeling your game will leave me with is one of pure regret. To give the Chinese room its due, I did like one of its games, the controversial Amnesia A Machine for Pigs. That's thanks in no small part to it adhering to this rule of involvement. You're still doing a lot of walking, you're still mostly listening to story, but events are unfolding in real time. Monsters stalk the streets, things are happening there, in the moment, right now. You're part of the story itself. I liked A Machine for Pigs because it included me in the world. I got to directly experience some events for myself rather than simply be told about them or observe characters who have far more emotional stake than me. If your game is simply about watching other people have their own alienated little stories, well your game is no better than the awful single player mode of Homefront, a shitty first person shooter experience in which your main job is to point the camera at the real protagonists. You don't want to be Homefront. You don't want to make your players into glorified camera people. Gone Home, while not the best game I've ever played, I'm not one of those people that thinks it's this god-given gift or anything, was one I enjoyed because it gave me that sense of involvement. It gave me a sense of belonging to the world by letting me know I was a member of the in-game family. There's, there's something as small as that can raise the stakes and make a player more involved. We just need a reason to care, you know? Making us a nameless set of eyes dawdling around and looking at the true characters isn't very compelling. Gone Home also works hard beyond that to give us a sense of connection to the missing family members. It dives pretty deep into the backstories of the player character's sister and parents. We learn a lot about their interests and motivations, and consequently care far more about them as characters. Compare this to Wanda, which gives us fucking nothing to go on but a few isolated snippets of vague, shallow backstory. Compare this to Rapture, which doesn't give anybody enough time to endear themselves, and instead prevents tiny slivers of dialogue without character development. I need to see these people as people if I'm gonna care, not just spouters of exposition. It's a trap a lot of these games fall into, giving us not characters, but simple relayers of info. Gone Home gave us character development, Ethan Carter gave us character development. Too many games simply give us dry information from static entities that never evolve and consequently have no meaningful existence. And give your world some damn life, won't you? This is what really killed both Wonder and Submerged for me. These pretty looking expanses of land that just felt fucking dead. There was no energy, no zest in the world, it reacted to nothing you did and it did nothing to you in turn. It just sat there, looking appealing but having all the depth of a slice of toast. It's a huge failing of games that demand exploration. Why should we want to explore when everywhere we go, everything we look at is static and unchanging and painfully, horribly dull? These games have lush green worlds that promise all sorts of enthralling sights and yet the post-apocalyptic world of Fallout, a world that is literally supposed to be fucking dying has way more liveliness to it than these titles ever could. When I think of a game that combines all the positives of the genre into something that's damn near perfect, I think of the Stanley Parable. A game that does all this. It's a game that gives you a tangible premise, a scenario that allows you to belong. It develops character by having the narrator that reveals more of itself as you continue to provoke it. As far as shifting tones, well, few games are as surprising as the Stanley Parable. While it's a comedy experience, 
experience through and through. It changes scenarios and plays with the medium of games so much, you're always feeling something unique around the corner. It's a game that responds to you, that unveils a story in which you're directly involved through the decisions you make. It directly rewards you for trying things, exploring things. And the things you do ultimately still consist of little more than walking and listening, but unlike so many recent walking sims, this game feels like it includes you in on the fun, brings you into its world, rather than treat you as a separate disembodied watcher, or worse, an uninvited guest. Because more than just bad writing, games that drop you into an empty map and expect you to give a shit right off the bat are simply fucking slapdash. No different from the dozens of early access survival crafting first person shooters you get on Steam, except the zombies in this case are replaced by tawdry dialogue. A lot of these games though receive critical acclaim, and I understand why. After years of action games and shooters, blood and violence, yada yada yada, people are starving for something else, they're desperate for that breath of fresh air and that unique experience, that, that innovation if you will. But we need to hold them to higher standards than we have now, because for most of them, the writing is pretty damn vapid and the environments a little more than vast deserts with tidbits of mild interest scattered across them. What's more, they're no longer unique breaths of fresh air. Dear Esther is years old, Stanley Parable showed the world how it's done ages ago, and that's still the top of the mountain, that's still the standard we should be aiming for, and we need to hold games to that standard, rather than giving them trophies just for a perceived sense of difference. Because I actually do like these styles of games, when they're done well. What I don't like is when they actually, genuinely deserve to be called walking simulators, because as much as that term is being earnestly discredited right now, there are way, way too many games that more than fucking deserve the label.